The one God sent as a special messenger to the end time remnant said repeatedly that God had not given all truth to those living in her generation. That God had more truth, new light to share with his people as circumstances made it necessary and as his people opened their hearts to the Holy Spirit. And so, I have received many compilations, page after page, about new light coming and the necessity of studying these new ideas carefully. Some Adventists have taken these statements very seriously and have come up with ideas new to Adventism. Now, I want to stress that these individuals are not those who have borrowed old error from the churches of Babylon and are trying to persuade us that the gospel which allows us to live with some degree of inevitable sin in our lives is acceptable with God, not those people. They are not trying to persuade us that this is the everlasting gospel of the apostles and reformers, that it's okay to allow sin in our lives. These are not those who are trying to persuade us that the church standards are just Victorian traditions that must be discarded if we want to be relevant and have growing churches. No, these are faithful Adventists. They are holding to the absolute authority of the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. They believe fully in our landmark doctrines. They are living up to all the light they have. They are faithful in lifestyle to the high standards revealed to the end time remnant. You see, there's only one thing wrong with Adventism. We have overstayed our appointed time on this earth by over 100 years. And so we're coming up with a number of reasons as to why we're not in heaven today. Some teach that we have been, error, have been in error on some crucial issues. And only when these are corrected do we have any hope of going home. Now, there's one inspired statement which I've never seen in these compilations of New Light. It's found in the Ellen White biography by Arthur White, volume 3, page 259. From that which the Lord has been pleased to show me, she says, there will arise just such ones all along and many more of them claiming to have New Light, which is a side issue, an entering wedge. The widening will increase until there is a breach made between those who accept these views and those who believe the third angel's message. Just as soon as these new ideas are accepted, then there will be a drawing away from those whom God has used in the work. For the minds begin to doubt and withdraw from the leaders because God has laid them aside and chosen more humble men to do his work. This is the only interpretation they can give to this matter as the leaders do not see this important light. End quote. Notice here that the Acceptance of this new light leads to a drawing apart from the body in small enclaves of those who have been enlightened with a loss of fellowship and trust with those who have previously been their friends and counselors. So today, I want to examine four areas of new light. They're not closely related, but somehow the acceptance of one seems to lead to the acceptance of others. Now, this will not be an exhaustive study of all the texts and the reasons raised, but enough to make some informed decisions about the merits of the issues capturing the loyalty of many faithful Adventists, remember, whose only motive is preparing to meet Jesus in the spotless robes of Christ's righteousness. The first one is the sacred name theory. It is said that the names for God and Jesus have been deliberately altered by satanic influences so that we unknowingly worship pagan gods by using their names. We are told that the only proper names for, for our God are Yahweh or Yah, Yeshua or Yahshua, etc., Y-H-W-H is the personal name of the Creator, and no heathen God is known by that name. So that can be the only name we use for God. Now, all error is always based on truth and is associated with truth. 
or it has no credible foundation. That it is absolutely true that Yahweh is the personal name of God as given to God's chosen people. And it expresses a very important truth about God. He is the self-existing one. There is no other being possessing self-existence. This is the difference between the creature and the creator. And it is perfectly proper to use this name today. The error is, this is the only name we can use for God. All other names are pagan and blasphemous. Only those who use this name can be sealed. That's the problem. So let's look at some points through here. Number one, here is what is said by those who believe this. It is true that there is no direct command as such to transliterate the holy name sound for sound into other languages of the world. So, no direct command. Now we do have commands to keep the Sabbath and to tithe and to observe communion and to turn the other cheek and to not take God's name in vain and many other commands. Why is there no command that we must use the name Yahweh if it is a life and death issue? Number two, the early church fathers like Clement of Alexandria, they knew about Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. -H. They wrote it in Greek as Yahweh. The Bible writers of the New Testament could have used this transliteration because it conveys the sound of the original word. But the Bible writers never used that once. They always translated, not transliterated, Yahweh as theos in the Greek New Testament, which we know as God, or kurios, which we know as Lord. So the early, so the Bible writers did not transliterate, they translated. Number three, Matthew 27, verse 46 is worth looking up right here. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. As Jesus is on the cross and he is crying out to his father, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, Eli is the Aramaic for, uh, tra word for El, the Hebrew, translated into the Greek as Theos, or God, in this verse. Both El in the Hebrew and Theos in the Greek, can refer to either God or heathen gods. It's a generic term. And here's the interesting point. Jesus used El, the generic name for God in the Old Testament, in crying out to his Father on the cross. And Matthew then translated it as Theos, God, there is no text that we know of in the Gospels where Jesus used Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. -H. Let's go back to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 6. As uh, God is beginning to lead his people out and uh, take them into the promised land. Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. All right? So here we have two different words. We have Yahweh, which is translated here as Lord, we have El Shaddai, which is translated as God Almighty. And then we have Jehovah, which is, again, Yahweh. So the patriarchs, the early patriarchs, knew him as El, which is E-L, not Yahweh. Yahweh became the covenant name between Israel and God through Moses at the time of that we are uh, looking at right here. 
Yahweh had been used from the time of Adam, but it was not the most important name until Moses and his time. Exodus 3.15 is um, probably the most important proof text for those who believe that it is only one name that can be used. Uh, verse 13 of Exodus 3 says, uh, uh, in, in ver verses 13 and 14 refer to Eya Asher Eya. Eya sent me to you. And here God first calls himself Eya, not Yahweh. That is later. Eya is not a proper name, it's a form of the verb to be. It encompasses the English idea of was, is, and will be. So there is a name that, he, that God is using for himself, which is not precisely Yahweh. Number four, uh, this is stated by those who believe this theory. The sacred name will be used as a mark to distinguish the true believers from the false at the end of the age. The controversy in the last days will be over his name and the name of the beast. The controversy during the days of Elijah was over the correct name. It will be so again. Uh, can I be sealed in my forehead with his holy name Yahweh and at the same time never call on him in prayer or sing praises to him by that name that seals and protects? It will be just as fatal to continue to use the wrong name as to continue to use the wrong day. These are the statements of those who believe this theory. And this is where the truth turns into error. Nowhere inspiration is the final controversy over the name of God. It is always about the worship of God. To make that as clear as possible, we, can only, we need only to read Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the, sea and the fountains of waters. In verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, that becomes the issue. Verse 11, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest no, uh, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And it was exactly the same with Elijah in this great con uh, conflict with uh, false uh, uh, religion. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And down in verse 37, it becomes the same point. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. And then that famous text in the, in the New Testament in Acts 4.12 as, uh, as the basis for all Christian faith and all belief in salvation. It is so simple and so direct and so clear. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given among heaven, men whereby we must be saved. And what is that name? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is the name. Number five. To establish the sacred name theory, some unprovable assumptions must be made. The first, the New Testament was written in Aramaic and later translated by corrupt translators into Greek. And they were the ones, it is said, who substituted the pagan names God, Lord, Jesus, and Christ so that Christians would be worshiping pagan gods. Well, there simply is no evidence for the New Testament being written in Aramaic. There is no hint in the earliest church fathers, which would be less than a hundred years from the finishing of the New Testament. The only book even speculated as being in Aramaic is the book of Matthew. And remember, Paul is writing to the Jewish Gentile churches in the Gentile uh, world here that, uh, that would never understand Aramaic. He could only use the Greek that they would understand. 
Luke was a Gentile physician who probably never spoke one word in Aramaic. In fact, let's just look at Luke chapter 1 in the very first verse as he introduces his gospel uh, to, uh, to uh, those who would be reading it. Luke chapter 1 and verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus is a Greek name, and he's writing to Greeks in this time period. So the corrupt Christian translator's theory has no basis in fact. If it was true, if it was true, then how much more of the New Testament did they corrupt? And how can we know which parts are uncorrupted? It is a wild theory necessary to support an erroneous theory about the name of God. Let's turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 26. And we will look at verse 14, Acts chapter 26, verse 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, this is Saul in his middle of the road experience with the Lord. When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, In the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then if you look over in chapter 22 of... Um, of Acts. Uh, there is another phrase here in chapter 22, verse 2. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. So it was so unusual to use Hebrew in the New Testament that it had to be specified here in the Hebrew tongue. And still, it was translated into Greek words by Luke so that the readers would understand. Now, it is claimed by those who believe this theory that Jesus, Elias, Jeremias, Isaiah, and Ezekiel in the Greek are all forms of Zeus, the Greek god. That has no evidence at all to support it. It's only a resemblance of sounds. Jesus does not mean Zeus is Savior. Again, from those who believe this theory, every time we use the pagan translated name Jesus, we are blaspheming that name. A translation of 1 Kings chapter 18.21 reads this way, If Yah be the Mighty One, follow Him. But if Jesus Christ, then follow him. That is how serious they are misusing scripture. That if we use the name Jesus Christ, it is equivalent to Baal. Number six, let's go back to Exodus chapter 33 and verse 19. Exodus 33 and verse 19. And he said, this is now speaking, God speaking to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So, what is the name really all about? The name of the Lord? It's his character. Name is character. Over in chapter 34, verses 5 to 7. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. So what is it all about, the name of Yahweh? It is on what Yahweh means, who he is, his character. Now the claim is made that only one name, Yahweh, is the proper name. All of the others are titles and must not be substituted for his name. 
I found this in Desire of Ages, page 363. He whose name is called the Mighty One, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Name, not title, name. Christ's Object Lessons 41. In order to strengthen our confidence in God, Christ teaches us to address him by a new name. He gives us the privilege of calling the infinite God our Father. In other words, our Father is a name, not a title. This name, she says, spoken to him and of him, is as music in his ears. His name, our God, our Father. In Present Truth, August 1, 1849, an angel explained to Ellen White what she had just seen in vision and used the names God and Jesus several times. God and Jesus. In Heavenly, Place, in Heavenly Places, page 349, his name, Christ Jesus, is to be our watchword. Notice that carefully. His name, Christ Jesus. Testimonies, volume 1, page 410. The name of God, the name of Christ, is so sacred to them, angels, that they speak it with the greatest reverence. The name of Christ. Number seven, when Hebrew scholars translated the Old Testament into Greek in the second century BC, they saw no problem at all in translating Yahweh with theos or kurios into the Greek language, just as the inspired writers of the New Testament did two centuries later. So the Hebrew scholars translated the Hebrew into Greek with the same words that the New Testament writers used. This was the Bible used outside Palestine, and it was the Bible used by Paul. Number eight, Ellen White consistently uses the biblical names for God. The CD-ROM lists 1,958 places where she used Jehovah, but not one using Yahweh. So it suggested that in her day, there was no version of the Bible that was, that was available that used the name Yahweh, so she couldn't have known that it was the right name, and she did not know that Jehovah was a false name. My friends, if it really was a life and death issue, especially since Jesus Christ wanted to come in her lifetime, might not the Holy Spirit have been able to enlighten her on that point? For instance, who told her that tobacco was a poison? Who told her that flesh contained cancerous germs? Who told her that milk and eggs would become unusable? Is God unable to correct a serious error regarding salvation? In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 307, she said that the fourth commandment is the only one having the name and title of the lawgiver, and it contains the seal of God. Now, what a perfect place that would have been for her to explain about the real name of God, Yahweh, by which we will be sealed. Nowhere is there a hint that the name of God is an issue at the end of time. It is always about obedience to the law and the Sabbath. Number nine, the sacred name theory must reword the Bible, substituting Yahweh and Yeshua for every instance of other names used, essentially rewriting the Bible, and also then rewriting the spirit of prophecy. In other words, rewriting what the Holy Spirit inspired to prove a theory. That's not much different than what we know as higher criticism of Scripture. And number 10, our attitude regarding this solemn issue will determine whether we are saved or lost. In other words, we are going to be saved or lost depending on whether we use the right name for God. They said again, the Christian pastor who knowingly continues to perpetuate this unscriptural Jewish tradition will be held accountable in the judgment. Do you think it will be safe for you to continue fellowshipping with those who call not upon the name of Yahweh? So there it is. You can't associate any longer with those who do not use the correct name.